the Minister for Justice, <coughs> the Attorney General, Honourable the Ministers of Justice, Excellency the High Commissioners, the Secretaries, Honoured Guests and Friends. I join the Minister in welcoming you here to Sri Lanka. In fact, the new election commission that we have installed has so much of power that you won't even notice election is taking place. <laughs> there will be no uh, election posters anywhere in the country which will my or outings out of class. <coughs> it's an honor to have you all here in Sri Lanka to have the meeting of law ministers and to discuss the topic of equal access to justice. Inclusive justice system. And more so in our part of the world because inclusive justice means that we also have to find the resources to implement it. You can't run away from these obligations so it goes hand in hand both the resources as well as the system that you will devise in the next few days. <coughs> but I will not therefore deal at length on the issue of equal access to justice because I have no doubt that you will deal with it thoroughly. But I would talk, I thought I'd say a few words about the Commonwealth Law Ministers and of course the Secretary General. The Commonwealth is dedicated to the principles, as you have said, of uh, democracy, rule of law, and human rights. Madam, first and foremost, I must commend you for the active role that you have played in upholding these values and for the fact that you lead from the front. It always draws fire, but nevertheless, you can't cook a battle if you don't expect to face. Fire. And you've been successful. I must thank you for the help you have given us here in Sri Lanka. Law ministers are all politicians, like all of us. You are politicians, but at the same time, you are a vital cop in the two main institutions, the relationship between the two main institutions which are common to all our countries and with the bedrock of democracy and the rule of law, that is the judiciary and the parliament. You represent your politician in parliament with the legal machinery of the state which is under you, also at the same time looking at the delicate relationship between the executive and the judiciary and parliament and judiciary. It is not an enviable job and many people I don't think would like to do a full term as Justice Minister. It's only fair that they be given a more cushy post and they <laughs> go along. I, in my career, was a Justice Minister for only for two months. And that was the election. But nevertheless, I must commend our Lady Minister for the active role she has played in the last few years. First of all, choosing to take up the post and thereafter being forced to do so. Having done a wonderful job. These two institutions are common to all our countries. We can't have democracy and rule of law without a parliament and without a high court, or high court, whatever you call it. <coughs> How do you manage the relationship between the two? That's the important. And they are interdependent. From the time of the Wills case and the Hansard cases when the privileges of parliament were upheld by the King's Court to today it has been an interdependent relationship. One cannot actually exceed the limits without coming to conflict, which has to be uh, avoided. We can see how the courts in many parts of our commonwealth help expound the law and to develop it. The, with a 200 or 300 year history of this relationship between the legislature and the uh, judiciary. <laughs> we in Sri Lanka are also proud of the fact that our Supreme Court is one of the oldest in the world. It was established in 18, 
and prior to that, there was a, a similar court system which was established by the Dutch East India Company, from which we took over the court system and the legal system. From then onwards, the relationship between the uh, Supreme Court and the legislature has been the one which was successful when they were interdependent. And of course, like in the history of any country, there were a few occasions when they were virtually born. But fortunately, for short periods. <coughs> and the power of parliament comes from the people. But it also has to be interpreted by the uh, courts. We in Sri Lanka have a peculiar system where are sovereignty invested in the people and is and the judicial power of the people is uh, exercised uh, by the uh, parliament through the court system. But we kept the court independent and the latest amendments to the constitution which established the constitution and constituted all judicial appointments to the high courts of the attorney general, of the inspector general of police, of independent commissions appointed by the constitution and council for the police, for elections, for public service, the National Audit Commission meant that we have an impartial system today functioning in the country. So in this way, we have kept uh, the lines separate between parliament, which theoretically what our first come vested, and then uh, with the Supreme Court, which actually exercises it. And I must say, in recent history, the Supreme Court has always upheld that constitution. We find similar thinking in different parts of the world as to what are the powers of the courts and what are the powers of parliament. Even in United Kingdom, where uh, the courts originally did not go into the issue of looking into the powers of uh, parliament, it has changed now due to one day. Not you, madam. <laughs> you are Danny of Strap, but Gina Miller, who in two uh, leading cases established the supremacy of parliament, <coughs> both in regard to the uh, UK leaving the European Union, and more so the judgment recently when the Federation case, where it says now, I think it will apply all to most of our countries that you can't prorogue other than for a very short term and the parliament business cannot in any way be disrupted by it, which means it's really uh, an achievement when the court was able to hold in favour really of the opposition's role to question ministers in parliament. It also means ministers can't be lodging parliament, which I hope will apply to a lot of ministers both out in other parts of the Commonwealth as well as in this country. But nevertheless, those, those cases are uh, outstanding and I think <coughs> the second case against the Prime Minister was also chaired by the ladyship, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of UK. So it looks as if all you ladies are now deciding <laughs> <laughs> important matters uh, of the Parliament. Similarly, before the six months before the judgment, in the prorogation case, we had a similar one in Sri Lanka, in the Supreme Court, where the dissolution of parliament by the president was challenged, because we have a fixed term parliament, and the Supreme Court held that only parliament with a two-third majority could dissolve itself. So that was upheld, and uh, as one of the beneficiaries, I am here back again <laughs> as Prime Minister, <laughs> including another Court of Appeal case, where the uh, Court of Appeal held that a Prime Minister cannot function once a vote or no confidence has been passed by Parliament. This is the historic judgment by the courts of Sri Lanka and the courts of UK, but all thinking alike. So we were all brought up, I think, under the same law from that time onwards, where we were in Sri Lanka. We quote the famous Javier Corpus case of Mark Anthony Grace and the time again, resort to Lord acting dissenting judgment in your seat versus uh, Anderson. So that it is a tradition which you all have established in UK 
which we have supplemented here in Sri Lanka, in India, some of the cases in Pakistan, in our part of the world, many others, some from Africa, but to enrich the Commonwealth because it's these two institutions, that interrelation, the ability to work with each other, which really is the <coughs> which really determines the success of rule of law. So I hope that our experiences can be used uh, by others in setting up the independent commission. I must, in fact, uh, commend the speaker for the lead role he has played in ensuring that the independent commissions function. And this is one uh, way for we to build up new traditions which sometimes may not be understood by those uh, who come in to politics, to the executive, as well as to law. So I don't want to take any more of your time, but the Commonwealth tradition is a tradition that should be maintained. As one of the countries that was there in 1949, it gives us great pleasure to see this institution functioning. <coughs> we do have one question, Madam, but I think all of us will have to ask wait till the general election of the United Kingdom and what role we have to play with the UK leaving the 